everyone. Uh, welcome to Big Tent. We are uh, an inclusive and collaborative community empowering women to take action, and protect our democracy. And we are thrilled to welcome court experts, um, Stephen Vladek and Dahlia Lithwick tonight. We have a lot to cover. Uh, recent Supreme Court decisions, including, of course, the independent state legislature case, uh, the court's ethics or lack thereof, um, what kind of reforms might help, and the shadow docket, um, what it is, what it portends. And we are very fortunate to have excellent guides through this thicket. Stephen Vladek is the Fed Courts professor I wish I'd had. Um, he holds the Charles Allen Wright Chair in Federal Courts at University of Texas School of Law. And he's the author of the bestseller, The Shadow Docket, which is fantastic. He's also the author of a newsletter, One First, and founding member of Lawfare, contributor to Just Security, and Profs Brawling. Um, and we also have, uh, we're happy to welcome back Dahlia Lithwick, who is an award-winning journalist and author. Um, her book, uh, Lady Justice, Women, the Law, and the Battle to Save America is also fabulous. Um, and Dahlia is a senior editor at Slate and covers um, Supreme Court and law and jurisprudence. She is the um, host of the bi-weekly podcast, Amicus, and is, um, is seen on TV and elsewhere as is Stephen. So uh, welcome. And tonight we're going to uh, basically start out talking about the cases and then some of the ethics and then get into the shadow docket. So I turn it over to Dahlia. Please put your questions in the chat. So, so I want to say um, thank you to Big Tent uh, for having me back, and I want to say congratulations to Steve on a really, truly phenomenal book that was almost impeccably timed, Steve, for this moment when everybody's trying to figure out what's happening uh, behind the scenes. And I think what we thought we would do, just because folks may have noticed there's been kind of a lot of news uh, in the last couple of days, so we thought we'd sort of spend a couple minutes rounding up what's happened at the Supreme Court doctrinally, and then turn to sort of some of the ethics and um, other issues that are happening also in the shadows. And then uh, I wanna give really fulsome time for Steve to talk about the thesis of his book, because in some sense, I think it knits these two stories together really elegantly. So, so Steve, maybe we will just start with um, you know, we've got almost all the cases that were going to come down have come down with the exception of the last few, which I guess we're going to get Thursday and Friday. And I think I want to ask you if you're at a place yet where you can sort of identify one or two big themes that make this term maybe different from last term, maybe different from what you expected. Sure. Um, Dahlia, thank, thank you for doing this and for taking time from your crazy busy schedule. Um, I, I can't think of that many people who I who I know are busier than I am, but I know Dahlia is one of them. Um, and thanks to Big Tent for, for doing this event. You know, Dahlia, you, you sort of hit on this already um, before the before the program started. I, I think the biggest theme of this term, and it's going to be true really no matter what happens tomorrow and Friday, is how much it's not last term. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, last term was from a progressive perspective, basically as categorical a wipeout um, and as meaningful and significant a wipeout as I think progressives had experienced at the Supreme Court since, oh, 1936. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not being facetious. Like, I mean, 1936 specifically, like, you know, 86 years. Um, and, you know, a lot of that was because you had this confluence of very high profile, very ideologically charged, very agenda-driven cases, Dobbs, Bruin, Western University's EPA. And I wonder if the story of this term, Dahlia, is that at least a couple of the conservatives have blinked um, and have blinked not because they're less committed to the agenda, um, not because they're less committed to their methodological whatevers, uh, priors, I guess, um, but because of the, forgive me for being a little crass, but shitstorm um, that their colleagues have stirred up um, and that reporting about their colleagues has stirred up. And so I think, you know, even if 
the affirmative action cases come out the way that I, I know I and I suspect you expect them to, with the court, you know, pretty much put on the kibosh on race-based affirmative action in higher education. And frankly, even if the student loan program gets struck down, which would require a pretty remarkable holding about why anyone gets to challenge it, I still think the moral of this term is that there is a not a middle on the court, but there is a sort of median group of justices um, who are meaningfully distinguishable from Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch. Um, and, and that group is, you know, the chief Kavanaugh and Barrett. And I think that's manifesting itself in all kinds of cases, big and small. Um, not that they're voting for progressive outcomes, Dolly, but that they're avoiding the, the big, ugly, conservative results that I think a lot of us have feared. Yeah, I think I want to lift up one thing you're saying, because I think it's there's been a little bit of intramural bickering uh, among progressives about, you know, how good is good and how bad is bad. And maybe it's just worth re-upping the idea that a lot of the cases that have went, gone well for progressives went well by not being disasters. In other right. words, they're kind of status quo cases, right? You know, the Indian Child Welfare Act wasn't gutted. Uh, Section two of the Voting Rights Act wasn't gutted. Uh, the completely lawless, ahistoric and insane independent state legislature doctrine is not a thing. But those aren't net wins. It's just that they're not losses. And I think it does raise one other question that's worth talking about, which is, it can't possibly be an accident, Professor Vladek, that Alito and Thomas are dissenting alone because they're the ones who seem to be caught up in, I think the doctrinal word you used was shitstorm, but they are the two who have yeah. been really shellacked in the press this year. And so it feels as though maybe there's some kind of through line between who is standing sort of at the outer reaches of you know, MAGA jurisprudence and who the chief justice, who a year ago, I think you and I were saying is ir irrelevant. You right. know, he's, right. he's, he's, he's either the fourth liberal or he doesn't matter. And suddenly it's his show again. And it's hard not to connect all of that sort of uh, extrinsic stuff that's going on to the possibility that at least Justices Barrett and Kavanaugh, who plan to sit on the court for 30 more years, may be the ones who are blinking. I think that's right. I, I would just add one more layer to this, which is, um, and this is, I don't want to get to the book yet, but just to pick up on a theme in the book, I think we tend to undervalue in these discussions how important it is that the court is choosing its docket. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about cases the court is deciding, these are not random things that have fallen on the justices' heads. These are the cherry-picked disputes that the justices have reached into the lower courts in order to decide. And so I think, you know, if you start from that status quo, when the court takes up a case like the ICWA case, when the court takes up a case, you know, like um, Merrill versus Bill in the Alabama edition case, the default is, you know, uh-oh, <laughs> um, right? Because the default is that they're granting to do something nefarious. And then when, when the ultimate decision is simply just not nefarious, you know, I can understand why there's a bit of, of relief on that part. The other piece of this, and I think this is something that may come out even further if the student loan cases are tossed on standing. Um, last term was in many respects the sort of long-term conservative wish list vindication term. Um, this term is uh, efforts to go farther. Um, and, and so, you know, I think if you look at, for example, the track record of my favorite and home court of appeals, the Fifth Circuit, um, this is the Federal Appeals Court for Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Um, the, the Fifth Circuit's having a terrible term and it's having a terrible term, Dolly, in ideologically charged cases where it keeps ending up to the right of the court. Um, and I think that like there's a, you know, there's a story there about how last term it was like the long-term conservative agenda coming home to roost on guns, on abortion, on environmental protection. And this term was, are we gonna go even farther? Like, are, are we going all the way to the crazy? And that's where I think you see the chief and Roberts uh, and Barrett and Kavanaugh saying no. Um, in the Mifepristone case, 
Um, in U.S. versus Texas, the case about the Biden administration's immigration enforcement priorities, which I actually think is quietly pretty important. So I think part of it is Thomas and Alito are out there on ethics island or ethics free island, depending upon how you want to describe it. But I think part of it is also that like Thomas and Alito and to some degree Gorsuch are on board this project um, that, that's, you know, that's flourishing in the lower courts and the chief and Kavanaugh and Barrett aren't. Um, and I think that's that's the distinction I see between this term and last term. So before we turn to your book, because I want to, as I said, um, do it justice, so to speak. But I think the other part of this is the laser focused attention on reporting, not just I mean, it starts with the Dobbs leak and then pivots to the Dobbs quote unquote investigation conducted by the Scooby-Doo kids. Um, yeah, exactly. That that nets nothing. Uh, but then it's really, I think, in full flower with ProPublica and Politico and the Washington Post breaking story after story, as you said, about these really, I think, not trivial ethics violations. And I want to be clear, there's been stories about what I think are probably trivial ethics violations that are getting yeah. left to Right. Justice Alito's wife, trivial, right? Justice yeah. Gorsuch's house, trivial, right? Right. Yeah. No. And and and, and we, we make a mistake when we, you know, dial it up to 11 for each of them. But I think that this focus and sustained attention on the fact that there are nine Article Three judges in the country who have no ethics code that is binding upon them has actually become very salient. And I compare it in my head, Steve, to, hey, Ginny Thomas was texting Mark Meadows <laughs> about setting aside the election results. That was a three-day story. Nobody cared. So I think something has burgeoned and that there has been, you know, you see the, the the efforts in Congress and the sustained attention that there is a sense, and it can't be separated from Dobbs and Bruin and the other cases from last year, that people think something's wrong at the court. And I think what I want to ask you, just as a way to pivot to your book, is that it's very interesting to me that we've just both stipulated that Chief Justice John Roberts has not been a maximalist on the merits docket by any means. He's been very careful, very, very moderate, very, very, very cooperative and minimalist, sometimes so minimalist that nothing happens. But man, he has been a maximalist on this ethics stuff. He has gone to the mat for the proposition that nobody touches his court. And I wonder if you think there's any interplay between the, those two imperatives. This is a guy who cares deeply yeah. about the reputational interest and in the integrity of the court, who seems to be fighting the wrong war. Well, or he's or he's caught between a rock and a hard place, right? Where, you know, part of his institutionalism is that he cares deeply about the court's long-term credibility, whether for the altruistic reason that the court's credibility is important unto itself, or for the less altruistic reason that how else can he advance his agenda with if, if he has a if he has an illegitimate court behind him. Um the problem, and this came out, I think, in his response to the leak investigation as well, the problem is that he can't affirmatively sort of um, kowtow to Congress, right? He can't, he can't sort of open the, the floodgates of, of letting the FBI into the building to investigate the leak, letting Congress call justices willy-nilly to testify without running into the same institutional problem. Because, you know, from his perspective, that will weaken the institution if we set all these precedents. Where I would push back is I actually think there's a really big distinction between the, the former, I'm not letting the FBI into the building to investigate the leak, and the latter, you know, anyone testifying before Congress raises separation of powers concerns. Because the former is like, this is our fiefdom. You know, if you know we have a police force, we have a marshal, like if we need to both, we'll do that. Um, the latter is is oblivious to history, and and you know the history that you know and that I think we don't tell nearly enough to folks out in the world, is a history where for the better part of two hundred years the Supreme Court was part of this ongoing dynamic inner branch conversation with Congress about its docket, about its budget, about its facilities, the building. Right? I mean, the court didn't even have a building until nineteen thirty five, and Congress used. A, 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 an array of powers as a means of exercising leverage over the court, um, leverage that was usually a response to dissatisfaction 
with the substantive decision making of the justices, with the behavior of individual justices. Congress cancels the 1802 term. Um, Congress forces the circuit justice for the Fourth Circuit to come back to Washington every August for no other reason than because they hated Justice Chase. Um, right? Congress makes a case go away that they were worried the court was going to use to get rid of Reconstruction. Um, as late as 1964, Congress docks the Supreme Court justices' pay raise relative to every other federal judge because they're mad at the court. Um, and I think, you know, folks, there's a lot of pushback from conservatives who say there's nothing new under the sun about this court. We've had ethics scandals before. We've had, you know, controversial cases over rule of precedence. To me, what is unique about the moment we are in is just how unaccountable the court is and how unaccountable the court believes itself to be. Um, and that is a radical difference from any prior moment in American history on both axes, right? The, that they're not actually accountable and that they don't believe themselves to be accountable. And I think that's a big part of the ethics story, why Thomas and Alito can act, you know, can sort of, instead of any kind of conciliatory tone or apology for clear violations of existing rules, why they can sort of dig their heels in the sand and say, you know, take this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal as my as my response. Um, it's why we're not seeing, you know, any real sort of move to, you know, moderate on ethics at all. And I think, Dahlia, to me, that's of a piece with the shadow docket story, because what it's about is it's about the Supreme Court having complete control over every facet of its existence. Um, and having this sort of this mentality that it's no one's business but theirs to decide how the court's going to be run. Okay, so this is the kind of gravamen of the book. Now we've reached the sort of beating heart of um, Steve's book, The Shadow Docket, which I think if you haven't engaged with it, you think it's just the kind of, of, of sliver that became fashionable to bellyache about two terms ago when the court was doing stuff on the emergency docket late at night, unsigned opinions. But as Steve just said, it's so much more. And I think that that is a really useful frame, Steve, to sort of explain the thesis because it's not just the learned helplessness of you know other branches of government who are now somehow have gotten themselves into this Patty Hearst moment where right. they just say we're <laughs> in love with our captor because we can't do anything we'll just like sit here and take it but the really urgent part of the book is explaining all the ways in which the court in very sneaky ways arrogated power to itself and nobody clocked it so if that's a fair framing yes. why don't yeah. you sort of explain how that worked because every chapter is another iteration of the same formula. Yes, yeah, so I mean, I mean, let me let me try to sort of start from where we are and work a little bit backwards. So, just terminologically, for those who are less familiar with the term, I mean, the shadow docket is this evocative shorthand phrase that was coined by a conservative law professor by Will Bode in 2015 as nothing other than a descriptive umbrella to encompass everything that the Supreme Court does besides the 60 some odd merits decisions we get each term, the rulings we've just been talking about. And you know, Will's insight that I've basically appropriated um, is that a lot of really important stuff happens in the shadows. Um, simply by volume, 99% of the Supreme Court's work um, is through unsigned, unexplained orders, not the big fancy merits decisions about which we spend so much time, especially this time of year. And, you know, many of those are anodyne. We don't care about, um, you know, when the court says we're not going to take up a case that is not important and that isn't wrong. Um, but increasingly, Dahlia, as you know, we're seeing the court use these orders in ways that affect all of us. So just a couple of recent examples, right? I mean, the you know, it was an unsigned, unexplained order from the Supreme Court that allowed President Trump to put the travel ban into effect. Um, it was an unsigned, unexplained order from the court that blocked President Biden's vaccination mandate for large employers in response to COVID. Um, it was an unsigned, unexplained order that allowed Alabama and Louisiana to use congressional district maps in the 2022 midterms that lower courts had said violated the Voting Rights Act, that the Supreme Court has now agreed <laughs> violate the Voting Rights Act. And so the, the sort of the I wrote the book because the way that a lot of us experience and consume the Supreme Court, right? We think about the 
the court as the sum total of its merits docket, that the court is the Dobbs, the Bruin, the West Virginia versus EPA, when the reality is that those are actually only creations of the court's power to govern itself through unsigned, unexplained orders. What do I mean by that? So take Bruin. Bruin is the big Second Amendment case from last term. So the Supreme Court radically expands the scope of the Second Amendment in Bruin in a case in which, one, the court didn't have to take the appeal, and two, the question that the court actually decided is not one the parties presented, but rather one that the justices themselves wrote and then granted, um, right? Something that happens actually fairly often at the search stage where the justices will say, oh, you're bringing this case to us, great. But instead of the question you want us to decide, we're gonna use it to decide the question we want to decide, um, right? Dobbs as well, Dobbs, the case that overruled Roe, no one, in, no one in Dobbs asked the court to overrule Roe in the cert petitions. And so the book tries to tell the story historically for folks who are not deeply versed in this history and this literature of how this came to be. Because the one thing that I think there's no dispute about is this is not um, originalist, right? This is not how the court started. This is not the way the court operated for the better part of a hundred years, um, right? Into the 1890s, the Supreme Court had no control over its docket. The court decided only those cases Congress told it to decide but if Congress said you have to decide it, they had to decide it. And so Dahlia, part of why I wrote the book is because it's not just about how the conservative majority has abused the shadow docket in the last six years. It's that I don't think we can fully understand how the court as an institution became so powerful and became such a central player in all of our lives without understanding the role of these technical, inscrutable, unsigned, unexplained orders going back generations, right? I mean, that's part of the story here. So maybe I wanna be Justice Alito just for one little second and say- and, He loves and folks, me. I know, folks should know that Justice Alito it adores the, 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 the term, the shadow docket and all of Steve's work. Um, and that was bitter sarcasm on my part, but I will say just to be provocative, you know, his response to, to the sort of uptick in criticism around the shadow docket is, but we've always had an emergency docket and these are emergencies. And it's not my fault that we had COVID emergencies. It's not my fault that we had immigration emergencies. It's not my fault that, you know, all of the things SB8, you know, it was an emergency. What were we to do? So we decided it at midnight um, in an unsigned order. And so will you just try to kind of, and I'm just being cheeky, but try to yeah. sort of parse out the benign, you know, and I know this this sort of um, gets to your death penalty chapter, but there's a benign version of needing an emergency docket, and then there's a pernicious one. Yeah, so, you know, this is a, a common response is exactly that. And, you know, my criticism, and I think, Dahlia, most of the folks who have been critical of the court are not anti-emergency relief. Um, the, you know, the Mifa Pristone case is a great example. There are going to be times when a lower court does something crazy and the Supreme Court can't really wait around two years for the case to come back to the court before it intervenes, right? The problem that has arisen is not the existence of this power. It's the way it's been used. And, you know, one of the things about Alito's defenses is he never really gets into the weeds of, of the, he never, he never gets into the receipts, <laughs> um, but you know, just to sort of back up a second, in the old days, and by the old days here, I mean like pre-1980, um, yes, the court had emergencies, but the way the court handled them was completely different, where basically in all but the most extreme cases, um, any emergency request would go to the circuit justice, the one justice who had geographic responsibility for that part of the country. Um, so, you know, for in the Fifth Circuit, Justice Alito, the Second Circuit, is Justice Sotomayor. Um, and the idea there is that that was a compromise because the circuit justice could provide maximum process. They could hear oral argument if necessary. They could write an opinion. But no one would confuse the interim, the emergency, the stopgap ruling of the circuit justice with a ruling of the full court. And that was the system we had all the way into the late 1970s. And what blows that system up is the reinstitution of the death penalty um, in 1976 and the just explosion of last minute emergency applications um, starting in death cases in the early 1980s. 
Now, I, I sort of, I'm going to cover a lot of ground really quickly here, but like it stays pretty limited to the death penalty through the 1980s, through the 1990s, through the 2000s, even into the 2010s. You ask folks who clerked on the court, you know, between 1980 and 2015, you ask them about the shadow docket, they'll say, oh yeah, the death docket. And it's in the death penalty context that we start to see problematic behavior. We start to see full court decisions with no argument, um, right? With no rationale, with no opinion, with no effort to explain why the full court is upsetting the status quo. But Dolly, I think most of us ignored it because it was over there, right? It was in the death penalty space and we just assumed death is different. Um, the real shift away from the death penalty and toward the modern explosive use of it for everything, including things that no one would think of as an emergency, um, starts with Trump. And it starts with you know a flurry of cases that the Trump administration brings where the emergency that the federal government claims justifies the court's intervention is simply the fact that a federal policy has been blocked and President Trump is being irreparably harmed by his inability to carry out controversial federal policies that lower courts think are unlawful. And so that's the real shift that starts in 2017 is, you know, we start to see arguments for using this power in contexts that are not remotely emergent. And we see the court acquiesce and the court just over and over again, granting emergency relief, putting back into place policies lower courts had blocked with no explanation and with no analysis of why the lower courts were wrong, with no analysis of why the policy should be allowed to go into effect. And this starts in Trump cases, but doesn't end there, right? It then bleeds over into COVID cases and it bleeds over into election cases and it bleeds over into Biden administration cases. So, you know, I think it's really a series of subtle developments that really, I think, accelerate, right? Once you have the flurry of cases in the Trump administration. I think you may have answered this question now, but several um, questioners in the chat are saying, you know, who's responsible on the court for this massive blossoming of the use of the shed? Like, is it this the chief's fault? Is this, can we blame um, Justice Thomas? Uh, how does it work in terms of yeah. Uh, because I, I under, I'm hearing what you're saying, which is that, you know, Donald Trump and his administration ran to the court every time they got a boo-boo. But who at the court do you think was the person driving the notion that we can do this in secret late at night with one sentence? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope one day we'll find out, um, right? At, at, for now, we can only speculate. So at first... Right, the, case, the Trump cases have a tendency of splitting the court right down conventional ideological lines, where you see a 5-4 split with the conservatives often voting for relief and the four Democratic appointees often voting against it. And then tell you something really strange happens, right? So Justice Kennedy retires in 2018 and is replaced by Justice Kavanaugh. And all of a sudden, a lot of these cases are still 5-4. But you know, now the chief is joining the Democratic appointees. And so John Roberts actually, I think, is the first one of the conservatives to think that maybe this has gone too far, um, right? And so he's the first one to actually join the liberals in denying a bunch of these applications, first in Trump cases, um, and then in the early COVID cases. And so where things really start to run off the rails is when Roberts is no longer the median vote. And that happens when Justice Ginsburg dies in September 2020 and is replaced by Justice Barrett. And it's really, it is that period, like the September 2020 to September 2021 is really the high watermark or the low watermark, right, of, of how aggressive and abusive the court is when it comes to emergency orders. Um, I see there's a, there's a question in the chat about sort of how are cases assigned. Um, so, you know, this is all happening in, forgive me, the shadows. Um, but the short version is that it's still technically the circuit justice um, who's responsible initially for figuring out what to do. And the circuit justice, at least in theory, has the power to resolve an application by him or herself. We actually saw last week, Justice Thomas turned away a really crazy application from Alabama um, in a capital case all by himself without referring it to the court. Um, the, you know, the norm that has shifted in 1980 is the court started adopting a practice where no matter which circuit justice gets the case first, if it's remotely contentious, if there's even a chance it's going to divide the justices, it gets referred to the full court 
and gets voted on by all the justices as if it were a merits case. And that's the shift that really starts the modern era of the shadow docket, because it comes with no shift in the norm of full court orders being unsigned and unexplained, whereas circuit justice rulings were usually argued and explained and had lots of process. Maybe before I, I, I want to get to fixes, because I think people want to hear um, you have described a kind of terrifying runaway train. Um, before we we get to them, I, I think I want to ask you to tease out in a world where it's still a decision of the court when the court says, um, you know, the the maximum occupancy rules uh, in COVID uh, violate the religious freedom of worshipers, and that becomes the holding of the court. There's a huge problem, it seems to me not just with the fact that you know these are dashed off on the back of napkins but that then you have lower court judges who are trying to make sense of some of these orders that are one sentence and we're not sure even what the holding was and so in a sense i think you know just to, to sort of make this very concrete because i think the idea of the shadow docket can be abstract a, a court that is given limitless power so long as it shows its work is not showing its work. I mean, that's the problem. And, and just to sort of, you know, not put the point too finely, um, the court itself has historically taken the view that its legitimacy comes from its ability to provide principled justifications for its decision making. Um, and the idea, I think, was actually fairly well captured by Justice Barrett in a speech last April at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library where she says, like, you know, the, the idea is not that you're going to agree with our principles, but that you're going to agree that they are principles. Um, and that, you know, that's what separates us from politicians, that we're not just voting up or down on legislation. We're actually explaining why this result is compelled by the relevant legal analysis. And Dahlia, when you have, you know, when all you're doing is small impact, insignificant orders that don't affect anybody, you can understand the temptation to not explain why you're not changing anything. But when you have the court intervening in ways that have massive downturn that affect millions of people, that affect you know, which party controls the House right now, which is not an unreasonable reading of the 2022 election cases, and the court is still not explaining itself, that becomes a huge problem for two reasons. One, it deprives everybody who matters of guidance. Um, and of every sort of, you know, lower courts don't know what the rules are, government actors don't know what the rules are, right? I mean, it's all sort of of a piece with that. But two, it makes the court look terrible because if it turns out that the best predictor of how the court's gonna rule in these applications is the partisan valence of the dispute as opposed to some neutral legal principle. If it just so happens that these unsigned, unexplained orders have this tendency to favor Republicans and hurt Democrats, then you're actually leaning into the problem. You're leaning into the charge that these are just politicians in robes. And just to back up one second, the only reason why we give unelected judges this much power is because we expect them to behave responsibly with it. And we expect them to exercise that power judiciously, not Dahlia as you or I necessarily would, right? Not to rule the way you or I would, right? But just to do what judges do. And you know, when you're issuing rulings that have massive real world effects with no explanation, that's not what judges do. And that's, to me, actually part of why what the court has been doing in the shadows is almost worse than even the most troubling of its merits decisions. Because you know, say what you will about Dobbs or Bruin or West Virginia versus EPA or what, whatever your hit list is of terrible decisions by the Supreme Court, at least they're decisions, like at least there's opinions in them. And, you know, that's what we're missing here. Let's talk a little bit about, um, we've probably hyper-focused a little too much on the narrowest version of the shadow docket, but I think as to your more global description of the problem, Steve, which is there's just too many powers that the court has granted itself, and there's too little checking and the court is more and more apt to view itself as uh, a needing of checks. Can you give us a little laundry list before we turn to the questions yeah. of some of the things that you think would be low touch, high impact, 
changes that could be made so that the court returned to this kind of good old fashioned life of writing cert and following instructions? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a, you know, sort of the, the lightness of the touch it sort of is a variable here. Um, so just, I mean, the lowest hanging fruit here would just be for the court to internally commit to providing even a modicum of explanation anytime it's going to grant emergency relief. And so what that means is if the court is going to stay or freeze a lower court ruling, if the court's going to reach out and enjoin some state or federal policy while a case works its way to the court, it doesn't have to tell us why. Um, they don't have to write 80 pages. I mean, the, you know, the CDC's eviction moratorium, the court wrote, I think, 10 pages. I actually thought they did a pretty good job in that, like an outlier example of the court doing it right, even if I disagreed with its analysis. So I think the very top level is committing to providing an explanation because that is at the heart of what judicial power is supposed to be. Um, you know, beyond that, Dahlia, there's a story here and there's a conversation here about just sort of what the justices are doing with these kinds of emergencies in the first place. Um, and so, you know, a sort of slightly heavier touch, right, which would probably require, if not the justices themselves, then Congress would be, you know, recommitting to the idea that emergencies are emergencies <laughs> um, and that it's not an emergency just because a government policy has been blocked, um, right, that irreparable harm requires some kind of showing that, like, something terrible is going to happen in the interim, um, that would be nice. Um, but more fundamentally, and I think this gets to a bunch of the questions in the chat, I think the real breakdown here is structural and not specific, um, by which I mean the real breakdown here is not, you know, any one small piece, but rather it is the just sort of disappearance of Congress. Um, you know, I, I, I hate to pull sort of the law professor must quote the Federalist, but law professor must quote the Federalist, right? Madison says um, the way the separation of powers is going to work is ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Um, the idea is that we, we want the branches pushing against each other because that's how they're going to keep each other in check. And, you know, for 175 years, that worked pretty well. Um, getting Congress to stop looking at the court as this hermetically sealed, cloistered, you know, it, untouchable institution um, across Dahlia, any number of axes um, is where this really starts. And that's, you know, that can start with any number of reforms, whether it's ethics or docket or budget or what have you. It just has to start because, you know, the mentality that Congress has nothing to say to the court and about the court um, is responsible for a lot of the mess that I think we find ourselves in today. And what do we do about the fact that at the end of the day, you can, you know, institute term limits, which we're hearing about now, you can, you know, strip jurisdiction, you can do all the stuff that Congress has historically done, and the court will pass on it and say it's unconstitutional. In other words, the same John Roberts who says, I don't have to testify because yeah. there's a separation of powers problem is going to be the 9-0, you know, ruling that you can't touch us because we're hermetically sealed. Then, you know, that will be, I think, the fastest way to the court completely delegitimizing itself. Um, I mean, the you know, are there some things Congress could pass that the court would strike down and wouldn't provoke that reaction? Sure. Um, but if Congress actually were to do Dahlia limited things that are things Congress has done historically, and the court were still to strike that down, then we go back into the same feedback loop. And at that point, you know, the court is basically putting itself on the chopping block. Just one historical sort of episode, I think, really helps to, to put this into context. I think folks are generally maybe loosely familiar with FDR's court packing plan. Um, this was, you know, after his landslide re-election in 1936, um, FDR proposes adding one seat for each justice over the age of 70. Just remarkably, that would give him six seats. Um, and a new majority on the court. Um, and, you know, the sort of the conventional wisdom is that the court packing plan failed because it, you know, Congress, even Democrats with it on the Senate Judiciary Committee pushed back. Um, and the plan just sort of was killed by members of his own party. Um, you know, Dahlia, at least in my con law class, I teach that the plan succeeded beyond its wildest dreams um, because FDR basically held a gun to the court's head and the court blinked. Um, right, you know, Justice Owen Roberts' famous switch in time, you know, even if it happened before the plan was formally introduced, right, the court moves 
in response to, or at least at the same time as FDR is putting pressure on them, Dalia, because at least at that moment, the court understood that they would lose that fight um, and that they would rather, you know, have, they, they'd rather keep nine justices with jurisprudence that was more agreeable to FDR than allow FDR to win so overtly. Like, we're not there yet. I don't think this is a political moment that looks remotely like 1937. But getting us into that way of thinking, right, thinking about sort of political leverage as a way of pushing the court to moderate its behavior, I think is something that, you know, we ought to talk more about because it's not about nuking the court, right? It's about reminding the court that they are capable of being nuked. And those are two very different things. It's so interesting. I've been thinking, uh, particularly after after the last two weeks and the switches in time that we've been seeing that I wonder if we're not seeing a baby version of, you know, the, the, the blowback to FDR's court packing. And the other just parenthetical note, I totally agree with you. Uh, the court packing plan was bad for FDR. I think it, you know, took him from being one of the most cherished and beloved presidents to, at least for a while, deeply maligned, but it was extremely good for the court. Yeah. And it, tells you all you need to know that we tell that as a story of failure because we think that the court is untouchable. It's really like we've derived completely the wrong principle. Um, there's a there's a, an interesting question. Um, Kitty Douglas is asking, are you surprised how SCOTUS has rejected Trump's 2020 election cases and all the ways uh, that Trump has not been a big winner? Uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court, given that, you know, I think you started, and I think you're correct in saying the rise of the shadow docket, in some sense, could, comes along with the rise of Trump's idea of emergencies. Trump actually doesn't fare well in the rise. No, he gets crushed. Um, Trump's record on the shadow docket is terrible. Um, and, and I think that's, this goes back to something we were talking about earlier, Dahlia, which is, at least when it comes to the Chief and Barrett and Kavanaugh, the daylight between them and the MAGA sort of legal universe at the moment is is pretty big, <laughs> um, which means, right, so, so where that distinction manifests is Trump, the president, does well, right? So Trump's policies, um, the court used a ton of unsigned, unexplained orders to let President Trump carry out very conservative policies for years on end without ever actually upholding them. But Trump, the person, does terribly. Um, and that was both on the shadow docket and the merit docket. He's lost every single one of the cases about him personally, about his records, about his finances, about his archived documents. Um, and, those, and they haven't been close. Um, and I think, Dolly, that's a reflection of, you know, sort of the, I, I, again, I, I, I just like chafe at calling it the middle of the court, but just sort of the, the, the institutionalist conservative part of the court versus the, you know, sort of, will do anything for the current Republican agenda part of the court. And I think that's, you know, how do I put this delicately? Um, that gives me at least a little bit of faith, right? Going into the 2024 election cycle, that this is not a court that's necessarily going to be in the tank for a candidate Trump either. No, I think that's right. I, I, I often think that in, if you look at it in the sort of, you know, uh, MAGA schema, you know, there's Steve Bannon justices, and then there's a bunch of pro-corporate, you know, justices who want democracy fundamentally to work. And I think that we could certainly, I, I feel comfortable at this point, putting justices Thomas and Alito much closer to the kind of burn it down, burn it all down. Uh, I think that, you know, this is a longstanding theme for both Chief Justice Roberts and Kavanaugh, that yeah. the reason business wins all the time is because they really like a democracy that works for the wealthy. And there's a bunch of questions uh, in the chat um, I'm just going to read uh, one from, from Gail Shields Miller. Is the change in SCOTUS due to the money corporations and big businesses are pouring into politics and the court? In other words, is the shift that we have seen in the court a result of the sort of open spigot post Citizens United? And some of the stories that we're seeing now, maybe this is the way to ask the question I wanted to ask which is the court's definition of corruption is so cramped mm 
yeah. that you would have to walk up to Clarence Thomas with big like Scrooge McDuck sacks of money and demand something that this is not corruption the way the court defines corruption, but it is fairly clear, I think, that big money is shaping everything. Can you can you kind of answer all the people in the chat who are asking how distortive big money has been? Um, enormously. Um, we don't fully know how much because a lot of it is dark money. And this has been where I think Senator Whitehouse has has been way out ahead of everybody. Um, I guess, you know, to me, the place where I see the money stuff the most, I don't know, tangibly Dahlia is in the administrative law cases um, where, you know, one of the places where you see a lot of alignment between the, the corporatist conservative justices and the, you know, the more ideologically conservative justices is on modern administrative law, um, where the court has basically just taken a hatchet to a whole bunch of fairly basic principles about the power of executive branch agencies. It's possible they're going to keep going as early as tomorrow in the student loan cases, um, where there's no, where in the student loan cases, the sort of the, the the premise of the problem with the program is that the statute's ambiguous. It's not ambiguous at all. It's just broad. Like Congress just wrote a very broad delegation of patent and they don't like it. Um, that's not supposed to be how this works. If I might sort of tie these threads together though, like part of the problem that actually unites the justices on this is that, you know, the same feckless Congress that has stopped regulating the court has stopped regulating. Um, and so, you know, it has left a vacuum for the court to fill or the executive to fill, which means, you know, the presidents of both parties are left to ever more creative interpretations, Dahlia, of 50-year-old statutes to justify policies that are very presentist. Um, and that you and I might think do or don't fit into the text of these old statutes, but where it's not like the statute literally says, you may do X. And, you know, I think it would be nice if the court would acknowledge the sort of the consistent through line there, which is, you know, we want Congress to do its job toward everybody and not just toward the executive. But I think it's the same vacuum um, that is both enabling the court to be much more aggressive in the administrative law space. And that is, you know, sort of amplifying, right, the separation of powers breakdown, Dolly, in a way that has this remarkable tendency of benefiting corporate interests. Because, right, the more hostile that the court is to the power of executive branch agencies, and the more the court says the answer is Congress, when it knows Congress is not going to step up to the plate, the more these decisions are actually just deregulatory. Um, and where the real through line in whether, you, whether it's the major questions doctrine, the non-delegation doctrine, the fall of Chevron deference, you know, you name a, a sort of technical administrative law topic, they are all deregulatory, um, which I think is where you see all these threads coming together. There's a whole ton of questions about court packing. Um, and uh, it's outside the scope of your book, but it's certainly, I think, top of mind for an awful lot of people um, you and I both have agreed, I think, uh, quite zealously that the threat of court packing can be quite a bludgeon. Um, what do you think about the possibility of adding a bunch of seats to the court? So um, I, this is, you know, everyone's, everyone's been enjoying this talk so far, and now they're going to hate me. Um, so I am, I am the Rara Avis. I am a progressive who is vehemently anti-court expansion. Um, and that's for two reasons. Um, so the first is just very real politic. If Democrats at some point when they control both chambers of Congress and the White House somehow add four seats to the court, there's no way in hell Republicans won't the second they are in the same position add six. And then the Democrats next time they're in that position will add eight. And in you know 30 years, the Supreme Court will have 41 justices and no legitimacy because it will just be so obvious that it is a tool for exercising power by whoever's currently in charge. Um, that to me is no way to sort of run the railroad. Um, the broader reason why I'm anti-court expansion is a little more subtle, but it ties back, Dolly, to the thread of our conversation, which is I think the more we talk about who the justices are, the more we're missing what the real problem is, um, which is a lack of accountability. You could have a you know, a better court with nine unaccountable justices if the justices 
were better models of accountability, if they were willing to voluntarily right, hold themselves accountable. We've seen Justice Kagan, for example, starting to explain her recusals, which is a very small but I think significant step toward voluntary um, accountability. But the reality is no justices, no number of justices can impel Congress to actually do its job. Um, right, That has to come from the legislative branch, not from the judicial branch. And so to me, it's both that I think it's a very myopic solution that would only harm the court in the long term. And it's, you know, getting at the wrong problem, which is, you know, we become persuaded that the problem is the composition of the current court, as opposed to the complete unaccountability of the current court. I, I'm, it might be idiosyncratic, but I'm, I'm of the view that it's more the latter than the former. So I, I've got um, two minutes left with you, and I'm going to ask a 20 minute sort of exegetical question. So do your best. But there's been some really nice um questions in the chat about originalism and textualism and wh wh where they are now and who's doing it. And I think um, we can all agree that maybe originalism is both having a moment and not having a moment. But there was a, a, a nice question about um, Katanji Brown Jackson, the newest justice, and the ways in which her sort of embrace of originalism this term has maybe inflected on how the justices are doing their own originalism. I wonder if you could sort of close us out with a thought on that relationship, because it's been quite pointed. Sure. So I think, I mean, this I think is actually, of all the things we talked about, this to me is the one that, this is the only thing that feels premature, because the, the impending Justice Jackson dissent in the affirmative action cases is going to be one for the ages and probably one that she's going to read from the bench, um, which it would be, when it happens, will be a pretty remarkable thing for a first-term justice to do. Um, I've been absolutely um, sort of floored um, by how like much Justice Jackson's hit the ground running, and I mean that in lots of respects. Um, she's become, in some respects, the sharpest questioner at oral argument. She's become, you know, she's just do dove in, dive, dove. She dove in, basically, willing to sort of go get her hands, her, you know, her elbow, just roll up her sleeves all the way to her elbows on originalism um, and on sort of pushing back against some of the most transparently frustrating features of historical arguments in these spaces. The affirmative action cases are a great example of that. I mean, she had a, a hypothetical, she had that long hypothetical question in the North Carolina case about the two North Carolina children. Um, that I just thought was devastating and unanswerable. Um, and so, you know, I don't, we should be careful about what that means, right? I mean, it doesn't, I don't think she's going to change anyone's minds on the court. Um, but I do think that there are opportunities in some of the lesser high profile cases for that kind of work to bear fruit. We've seen actually, I've lost track, I think four or five times this term where she has joined concurring opinions by Justice Gorsuch, or Gorsuch has joined a concurrence by her. Um, I would not, I did not see that come in. Um, and so, you know, I, I think what I find most energizing about it is she is like the anti-Briar, um, right? She's a fire breather where Briar was an academic, right? She's a sort of, you know, she's aggressive where Briar was restrained. Um, and I think that that's gonna be you know, very, very visible if the court does what I think you and I both expected to do in the affirmative action cases. So I, I want to thank uh, Steve Lodick and turn it back to uh, the good folks at Big Tent to um, play us out. But I also just want to say thank you to all of you for the work that you're doing to hold up democracy. It's incredibly, incredibly important now more than ever. It's been a real honor to share the stage with Steve. Thank you both so much for coming. This was amazing. And we look forward to following what you have to say as the term continues. Mm -hmm.